Well, good morning, happy Sabbath once again. Most of us, of course, are all just returning from the, the Feast of Tabernacles a couple weeks ago, and I uh, uh, got a chance to uh, talk to quite a few of you about how uh, that went, and by and large, uh, the reports are all very enthusiastic, although some came back with some illness. Uh, the feast itself seemed to go well. I heard lots of good feedback that the, the messages uh, were encouraging, the fellowship was good. And we had eight days worth of hearing, you know, a couple of messages a day, whether it was a sermonette and sermon or split sermons or a Bible study or what or something like that. And over the course of eight days, that adds up to something like 20 or 25 messages, which is normally what it we takes us like two or three months to hear. So we kind of got supercharged infusion there of God's word, and it's a real blessing. And besides all that, there's the fellowship. There's just being around so many brethren of like mine, even if you went to a quote-unquote small fee site where there was a hundred people, that's still, you know, five or six times what we're, we're used to normally being around. Uh, in Panama, we had 727 on the high day, and we weren't even the biggest site. I think Jekyll had 760 this year, Branson had over 700. Uh, so there were quite a few sites, and we had lots of visitors. We had other Church of God groups come. We had, uh, we had a pretty large teen crowd. I think we had a total of 60 registered, and I think at the, uh, the, uh, the, the teen fellowship, we had like 59 out of 60 there, and a Bible study was like 45 out of 60. So we had a lot of participation. So it was just a highlight for, for on all sorts of levels, you know, the, the actual word that we heard, and then the fellowship and just time. You know, and I think thinking about the word, the messages we heard, you know, we heard a lot about the kingdom of God. We heard a lot about in the sermonette today, about what our roles are going to be. We'd heard about the changes that are going to happen, the things that are going to come in this world, all the different things that uh, need to happen between now and then. But now that that's all happened, now that we've just spent time rehearsing, of course, the time that leads up to the millennium, we've talked about you know, the Feast of Trumpets, and we've talked about God's wrath being poured out on this earth, that we've talked about the binding of Satan, we've talked about the, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, and then afterwards the second resurrection, the great white throne judgment, all those things. It's very important for us to understand those and be inspired of those, but it can be a little tempting to, after you've heard that, say, well, okay, now what? <laughs> we just twiddle our thumbs <laughs> and hurry up and wait. And wait until Jesus Christ comes and restores everything. And we're just kind of along for the ride. Now, quite frankly, some people have, have taken that approach over the years, and I don't really think that's the best approach. I don't think that's what uh, God has in mind for us. In fact, if you turn over to John 10, John 10, let's talk a little bit, starting with this one little scripture. I'm going to jump into the middle of the thought here. John 10, verse 10, in the latter half of the verse, he says this. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, this is kind of, again, in the middle of a, of a thought, a section of scripture. Jesus Christ is talking about how he is the true shepherd, but he says, you know, I, I didn't just come just, you know, to be here to tell people, to warn them to change and this and that and the other. He said, I, I came so that people could have a more abundant life, not just in the future, but here and now. And that's what I want to talk about today. Christ came and lived and died so that we can have an abundant life. We can grow. He wants to see us thrive, not just survive. Today I want to look at a story that hopefully can help inspire us to this fact that we can thrive. We can have an abundant life. We don't just have to twiddle our thumbs and kind of wait around for everything to happen. 
we're going to actually kind of go through what led up to this statement here in John chapter 10. It was right about this time of year, in fact, when this statement would have been made. It would have been just after the feast. Jesus, of course, taught while he was at the feast. Then he gave this statement afterwards. But what he taught was, in essence, this. You can have an abundant life. You can have an abundant life. So today we're going to look at a story, a story of a blind man who was healed. And we're going to see how he chose, rather than to be stagnant, rather than to hurry up and wait, to have an abundant, fulfilling life. Now to understand this story, like any story, we need to get a little bit of context here. So we're going to back up a little bit. The exact timing of this whole scenario is, is somewhat debated, but uh, I think you could say that it's very safe. It was at least um, at the end of the feast, just after the feast. In John 7, verse 1, John 7, verse 1, just back up a f- couple of pages here. John 7, verse 1 says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. So, you know, there was already a little bit of heat on, as it were. The Jews were not happy with what he had been teaching. It says, now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. He uses the term, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, and so sometimes people will point to this particular scripture and say, ah, yeah, see the feast and all that stuff, that's a Jewish thing, right? It's, it's not a, a God thing. Well, no, it is a God thing. You know, uh, Leviticus 23, we're all very well aware. It's, the Lord says, these are my feasts. Now, John was giving some context to his audience, much of his audience would have been Gentile, and sort of their reference was to understand that this is what was happening at that time. It was really only the Jews that were practicing it because, you know, Israel had already gone into captivity and been broken up, and so all you had left sort of at that time of people who were keeping the feast were Jews. So he's giving a little bit of context so his audience understands what they're talking about. You know, it's like um, if you said the, the 4th of July and you were tell, explaining it to somebody over in, in China or whatever, you would say, well, it's, it's you know, uh, the Americans' 4th of July to give it a context. Oh, you're talking about, about that holiday in particular. Anyway, as we carry on through this, skip on down to verse 10. It says, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast, said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, chronologically speaking, this would have been, uh, you know, kind of in the middle, maybe towards the earlier side of Jesus Christ's three-and-a-half-year ministry. It certainly wasn't at the very end, uh, but it would have been middle, maybe front half of, of his ministry. And he had been speaking long enough to, to like I mentioned, you know, like we read there uh, earlier in, in the first couple of verses, that uh, a lot of people weren't happy with him. <laughs> and so, you know, there was some heat on. And so it, it wasn't even really popular to even talk about him because, you know, you could be labeled as a, a heretic if you're, you know, kind of following this crazy, you know, rabbi or whatever they might have used to, to refer to him. So uh, people didn't speak about him openly. They spoke about him kind of in, in hushed private conversations, right? You know, how did you hear what Jesus said? Sort of a thing. Continuing on, it says, Now about the middle of the feast, uh, feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Now obviously, clearly, this is in the middle of the feast. Scripture just said that. Uh, Jesus is speaking, and apparently he's really good at it. Uh, you know, he speaks in a powerful way, and people are like, wow, you know, this fellow's really good, even though he was, you know, a, a quote-unquote no-name, right, in terms of the Jewish community. You know, it might be akin, like, if you went to the feast this year, and, and maybe you heard a sermon from a guy that you've heard sermons from for 25, 30 years, somebody that you've known uh, heard speaking a long time, and then maybe the next day somebody gets up who's, who's a younger person and, and maybe you never heard him speak and say, wow, they, they actually did a really good job. I don't remember him. You know, he didn't go to ABC or Ambassador, by, or Ambassador College or anything, but you'd be pretty, maybe you were pretty impressed by somebody that you heard. We, we see a similar thing here. You know, they're like, wow, he's, he's really good. 
Verse 25, skipping on down a little farther, he said, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. So the debate is raging on. So who is this guy? I mean, isn't this the one everybody wants to kill? But, wow, he speaks very powerfully. What, why aren't they, they killing him? Is this Christ? Is, is it an imposter, you know? Um, they really weren't, weren't sure. Verse 28, then Jesus cried out as he taught them in the temple. He said, you both know me and you know where I am from. He knew the conversations that had been going on about him. He says, you know where I'm from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Christ lays it out there pretty much as plainly as he can. <laughs> you know, I am the Messiah. I am the one that is sent, that God sent. It's no bones about it. It's a pretty, pretty bold, direct statement here. With that, verse 30, it says, Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Now, some that said, okay, that's all we need to hear. This guy's a heretic. Uh, we're going to stone him or do whatever. But, you know, God didn't permit it to happen because Christ's ministry was not yet done. So it, it didn't happen. It says that many of the people believed in him. So some who maybe were on the fence became convinced. He said and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? You know, they kind of pointed to him and said, listen, you guys are saying this isn't the Messiah, but if the Messiah comes, what's he going to do more than this guy has? <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's put on a, a pretty good proof of who he is. So, you know, some were convinced he was not Christ, but others were at this point in time. Verse 32 says, The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things and concerning him, and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little longer, and then I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? You know, so the religious leaders of the day, they were just convinced he was a, a babbling fool. And they're like, where is he going to run? Where is he going to hide? He said, does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? You know, maybe he was going to go uh, up and, and you know, leave the country, basically. He says, what is this thing that he has said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. So, you know, the leaders of the day really just weren't understanding who and what Jesus Christ was. Uh, they were blinded to it. They refused to see it for probably a variety of reasons, you know, much of which was maybe their own jealousy because they wanted to retain power. But they just didn't see it. Verse 37, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus cried out, now you might recall just before the Feast of Tabernacles, I, I read our uh, study paper on this particular subject on the late last day versus uh, using the term the last great day uh, versus the eighth day. And if you recall, uh, basically there's, there's kind of enough ambiguity in this particular scriptures that you can't say definitively whether this was, you know, day seven and that's referring to the last day of the feast or was this the, you know, eighth day and that's why for many years we called it the last great day. So hence... You know, you're free to call it the eighth day or the last great day, either one. But at any rate, that's the, the, this is the scripture where that term last great day comes from. But he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, um, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow, uh, will flow rivers of living waters. Now, most commentators feel like this is, would have been right after what was known as the water ceremony. Now, the, the water ceremony wasn't necessarily something that was commanded in Scripture. It's not a part of the sacrifice, uh, sacrifices, uh, but according to Jewish tradition, it was something that had a, a great amount of joy associated with it and would have been performed during the feast. i got a couple references here I'll, I'll mention. I'll actually read from on the subject. This one is from JewishEncyclopedia.com. 
It says, At the morning service on each of the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, a libation of water was made together with the pouring out of wine, the water being drawn from the pool of Siloam. Why the rabbis laid such stress on the water libation is not clear unless they, there were weighty reasons which have not been recorded. It may have been emphasized to counteract the Gentile practice of offering wine only, or it may have even been intended as a temperance lesson. At all events, the Sadducees were strongly opposed to this interpretation of the law. So the Sadducees saying, well, okay, there's nothing really in the Bible that says to do this. They, they didn't like doing it. It says, to express their contempt of the Sadducees, on the one hand, and to strengthen their own position on the other hand, the rabbis embellished the libation of water with so much ceremony that it became a favorite and a distinctive rite on these occasions. So, you know, the, the Sadducees said, this really isn't in the Bible, you shouldn't be doing it, and the rabbi said, oh yeah, we'll show you. <laughs> we're we're going to make this a fan favorite, so to speak, and, and they did. And so there was a lot of joy associated with this water ceremony. By the way, it says, after the destruction of the temple, the libation of water, uh, being a portion of the sacrifice, was discontinued, but the custom of rejoicing was retained for some. It says, probably the ceremony originally included a symbolic form of, par- of prayer for rain in the winter se- season. So whatever the reasons were that it was such a big deal, uh, the fact was it was a big deal there for the Jewish community. And so Jesus capitalizes on it. Verse 39. He says, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, which those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, you know, Jesus is kind of giving a prelude when he's talking about this pouring out of water to talk about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that would come to people. Of course, that hadn't come by and large to most. So he is kind of giving a little bit of a foundation that's saying through him, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit would be made available. Verse 40, he says, Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, Truly, this is a prophet, others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Uh, You know, people were still debating who Christ was, but the feeling was growing, this guy is something special. You know, this isn't an ordinary average rabbi. Uh, let's see. Verse 45 says, Then the officers came to the chief priests with the Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? So, you know, the Pharisees were, were pretty much done with Christ. They were ready to get rid of him. And the officers said, No man ever spoke like this man. Now, those in charge wanted Christ arrested, but those who were actually charged with going to arrest him said, you don't understand, man. This is not just an ordinary average guy out here speaking. Then the Pharisees answered them and said, Are you also deceived? So now the, the boss guy, the, those in charge, the Pharisees, were uh, upset with those that they had charged to go arrest, arrest Jesus. And they said, Well, you, you guys have been taken in by this con artist too. It says, Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? So we haven't believed in him. You know, why should you? says, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? So now you have one of the leaders saying, well, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> you know, you all already condemn him, but you haven't actually really seen him or, or given him a chance. And then they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So now they're, they're criticizing you know, Nicodemus for believing this guy from Galilee. Galilee was basically the hillbilly region of Judea. And they said, you know, there's, there's nobody who's, who's of any count ever come from that area. Uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, was kind of looked down on and frowned upon. So now Nicodemus is kind of looked down on as being you know, suckered in by, by this Jesus fellow as well. Uh, verse 53, it says, And everyone went to his own house. So now, if this was indeed the end of the seventh day, not yet the beginning of the eighth day, if it was indeed the seventh day, uh, people would be permitted to go home for the eighth day. Uh, For the Feast of Tabernacles were commanded to go and and dwell in a temporary dwelling. Now, our tradition has been since most of us get up and are driving our cars and we go a long way to keep the feast somewhere, we keep the eighth day, or the last great day as we call it, 
just all together with the same people that we just kept the Feast of Tabernacles with because we've all driven hundreds of miles. But it is technically a separate feast. Now, if you were keeping this feast in Jerusalem and you maybe only went a few hundred yards to go set up in a temporary tabernacle, then you could go back to your house and be at home on the eighth day. And it seems like that's very possible what was happening here. Uh, most likely, uh, beginning here uh, in chapter 8, it seems that this has really been the beginning of the eighth day or the last great day. But as I said before, there's enough ambiguity that we can't really say that uh, definitively. So that sort of sets up chapters 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 7, by and large, is going on and during the feast. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, it seems there's a pretty good argument that much of these actually play out on the eighth day itself. And if not on the eighth day, it would have been just after the feast. But it's a pretty good argument that it actually would have been on the eighth day. The feast for the people of Jesus' day, much like it is for us today, is a high water mark for our year, isn't it? It's pretty much what we look forward to all year long, and then as soon as it's over, we start counting down the days to the next feast, right? You know, we start thinking about it. It's a spiritual high. It's a physical. It's an emotional high. This particular feast was, was particularly interesting because there had been a lot of debate going on. This Jesus guy, he got up, he spoke, and wow, it was amazing. Is he who he says he is? Uh, is he not? And, and even if you were just kind of sitting back, you know, watching the fur fly, you know, it was interesting, right, to see all this debate going on. It was kind of an exciting time. People were upset, uh, or maybe upset, some were upset. Uh, I'd say excited, stirred up in one way or the other. You know, there was a lot going on. So that's sort of our background right now. Chapter 8, verse 1. We see Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, so while most people were going home, maybe he went out there to meditate a little while, and I think we'll, we'll see why here as we continue to read the story. At verse 2, it says, Now early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Uh, everyone's gathering at the temple, so again, kind of points to the likelihood that this was a, a holy day, a time for teaching, so uh, kind of more evidence that this quite possibly was the eighth day. Uh, next, we read about the story about the woman who was, was caught in adultery. We'll skip over that uh, for now, but notice what he says in verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in, in darkness, but have the light of life. The day before, Jesus had said, you know, if you thirst, come to me. Drink. He says, if you're stumbling around in the dark, come to me. I'm the light. He points that those who would follow him could have something different. They didn't have to be starving in a world that didn't understand what was going on. They didn't have to be stumbling in a world that was blinded with darkness. Jesus Christ said, it can be different. It can be different. What we begin to see here then really is quite simple. We can make a choice on how we want to live. We can decide, do we want to continue to kind of scratch around in the dark, stumbling around with a dry, parched throat, because we're dying of thirst? Or do we want to live a little bit of a different life? Jesus Christ was pointing to the fact that if they followed him, life could be different. Now many took this as blasphemy, and if he would have been an ordinary man, it, it would have been blasphemy. But of course we know that he wasn't. Some thought he was taking away from God. He was actually pointing to God. He goes on to talk about he and the Father being one. They are one mind. And we know that when we follow Jesus, we're following God. So quite simply, he lays down a, a, a basic step on having an abundant life. Do you want to have an abundant life? Is that what you want? That's what I want. <laughs> Do you want to have an abundant life? Abundant life? then you need to make the conscientious choice to follow Jesus Christ. Now that seems very basic. It seems very simple. But at this point in time, right after the Feast of Tabernacles, 
That's where Jesus Christ kind of starts and points out and says, if you want an abundant life, you're going to have to follow me, which in turn, of course, meant following God, following the Father. Not just knowing what he said and did, but being his disciple. Now, I've mentioned before, I've kind of personally, not that you can't use the term, but personally, I've kind of gotten away from using the term uh, Christian, <laughs> just because uh, so often, you know, many people label themselves as Christians, and then I see how they live and behave, and I'm like, I don't want to be labeled <laughs> like that person. And I'm not doing this to try to make myself different, but I just do it to remind myself, you know, my job isn't just to go around proclaiming to be a Christian. My job is to actually be a disciple, to actually be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Now, in one way, we just did exactly that, right? Jesus Christ kept the Feast of Tabernacles, and so did we. So we followed his example in that way. Another example we just read about was, you know, he had no fear to preach the gospel. I mean, people wanted to kill him, and he said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. Although he was wise about it, he was careful, he went ahead and preached the gospel. How often do we do that? Now, I'm not talking about getting up on a street corner or standing behind the pulpit or whatever and giving a sermon. But when people tell us that they're all excited for Halloween <laughs> and they say, can't you wait? What do we say? Do we say, uh, it's not really my thing? <laughs> or do we take the next step and say, well, you know what? I, I don't observe Halloween for, for very uh you know, personal r religious reasons. You know, I, I think if you did a little study on the subject, uh, you'd probably understand why it is I don't celebrate it. Now, I'm not saying you go around condemning people. I'm not saying you go around and say it in such a way that your, you know, child's teacher has to call you from school. <laughs> We've had that happen. <laughs> but, you know, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Verse 31, I want to go ahead and jump forward here. Verse 31, still in chapter 8. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, says, If you abide in my word, you are my, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. My father-in-law gave a sermon on this once upon a time, and he says, his summary for that was basically, you've got to stick with it and not make excuses. And we're all pretty good at making excuses, aren't we? <laughs> I'm great at it. You know. But Jesus Christ says, you have to abide in my word. Don't just tell people you follow me. You have to abide. You have to live in it. He says, if you're my disciples, and what's a disciple? You know, it's a follower. Somebody who is trying to be trained by the teacher. We heard a sermonette about being a teacher. Are we allowing ourselves to be taught? Are we adhering to what our teacher has taught us? You know, it's one thing for ourselves to call ourselves, or it's one thing to call ourselves a Christian, right? It's another thing entirely to actually be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ points out that's what we need to do. We need to actually abide in him, and when we do that, we will be free. And I would add, we'd be free to have an abundant life. I'm going to continue now on over in chapter 9. In chapter 9, we start to read about the story of a particular man who was healed of blindness. And I think you're going to note something very interesting about his personal progression as you read through chapter 9. Note just how he was at the beginning of the story versus kind of how he is at the end. Uh, I also note, by the way, not only how he changed, but by, or excuse me, not just how he changed, but that how those who were questioning him refused to change. And we're going to see an interesting kind of sort of compare and contrast as we go through. So let's start 
uh, chapter 9, here of uh, the book of John, verse 1. Again, uh, it seems like this very could possibly all have occurred on the same day. We don't know, you know definitively that it did, but it seems very possible that this was all happening on the eighth day. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And I mentioned this in this uh, sermon last week, talking about uh, illness and disease. You know, sometimes people are sick, and we try to say, "Oh, what did they do <laughs> to get that to happen to them?" Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the disciples, you know, said the same thing. Well, okay, who sinned? Was it him or his parents? <laughs> for them, it was a black and white thing. It had to be one or the other. And Jesus said, "It's none of that." And he said, uh, "This man was blind, so that the works that I'm about to do could be manifested." So, you know, sometimes things have nothing to do with whether we did anything right or wrong. Sometimes, you know, we go through things so that God can be glorified. And Paul, of course, uh, alluded to that as well uh, with his thorn in his flesh. Christ also points out the fact, you know, I need to be working now while I can work. Of course, he would uh, only have about a three and a half year physical ministry here on earth before he was crucified. I uh, say the day is coming when I'm not going to be able to do this, so I need to do this right now. Verse 6, it says, When he had sa uh, said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, if you went to a doctor today and part of his remedy was to spit on dirt and then rub it on your face, you'd probably be looking for a new doctor, right? <laughs> I probably would. You know, most of the time we expect him to give us a pill or do some treatment or whatever. <laughs> you know, but this was uh, how Jesus was going to manifest this great work that God was doing. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Also, remember, that's where the water for the ceremony, water ceremony would have come from, was the pool of, pool of Siloam. Kind of an interesting little connection there. It says the man, he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. Christ prepares a little clay, he gives a little bit of instruction, and the man did what Jesus Christ said. We hear, or we see here, a simple command and a simple act of obedience. And through it, the man is healed of blindness. He said he'd been, he'd been blinded from birth. And we're not told exactly how old this fellow is. We read a little later that his parents say, well, he's of age, so he was probably, you know, uh, late teens at, at least, you know, who knows, uh, maybe up into his 30s or something like that. So he'd been blind a long time. You know, we, we probably all, I know I do, uh, take for granted uh, being able to see. Uh, when I don't have my glasses on, I don't see real great. My wife was asking me something, you know, this morning about, uh, when getting dressed, and I said, I don't know. I, haven't, I don't have my glasses on. I can't tell you, you know, <laughs> if, if what you're wearing matches. Uh, I'm not totally blind as a bat, but uh, uh, close, close enough, I guess. But this fellow was completely blind, and now I can see. So this is an awesome miracle that got performed right here. It says, therefore, uh, verse 8, it says, therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind says, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. So here it is, again, either on the eighth day or just after the feast, this tremendous miracle is performed. People look at it and said, oh, is that Job? Or whatever his name was, <laughs> you know, is that him? No. Can't be. That's just somebody looks like him. He said, nope, it, it's me. <laughs> it's me. You know? So there's some disbelief going on, even though this great miracle was performed. Verse 10, therefore they said to him, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. So a couple things to notice here. Again, part of it is that there's a group of people that had just kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, a great miracle is performed, 
yet they still are staring in disbelief, right? Their thought was, this has got to be some sort of trick or, or whatever, you know, this is a different person. Their first thought wasn't, God has performed a miracle. Now, have we ever been guilty of that? You know, have we ever prayed for something, whatever it might be? You know, maybe it's healing. Uh, maybe it's that, you know, traffic be light on the way home or something, Wh whatever it is. And then, then when it happens, we say, oh, well, good. I'm glad that worked out. And maybe we overlook the fact, well, you know, maybe God heard your prayer. <laughs> and, and maybe he actually intervened, whether it's something major or something minor. So we've probably all been guilty of it. But also notice what the man says about Jesus. Now, he did obey Christ, as we noted earlier, but what does he refer to him here? He says, this guy named Jesus. <laughs> he doesn't really honor and glorify him in any way. He just says this was the man's name. He really says nothing more than that. He, he's not saying anything bad about Jesus, but at this point in time, he's not acknowledging who or what Jesus was. Maybe he was, you know, still in shock a little bit. If I'd been blind all my life and then all of a sudden I could see, uh, you know, I'd probably be in shock too, right? But at this point in time, he doesn't really acknowledge him, just that he's a man named Jesus. He doesn't say more than that, at least not yet. Verse 13 says, they brought him uh, who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was uh, a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So this kind of also points to the fact that this was possibly the eighth day, an annual Sabbath. Of course, it could have been, uh, you know, a weekly Sabbath or something like that, but I think this does lead credence to the thought that this all was occurring on the eighth day. Verse 15 says, When Jesus also asked him, uh, excuse me, when the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight, he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. And therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Now, what a reaction. Wow, a miracle. The guy's been healed. Yeah, he can't be anybody real. He, he, he uh, healed on the Sabbath. Well, we know that elsewhere, you know, the Pharisees had trouble with this concept, didn't they? They had in their mind, you couldn't do that. That's work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God couldn't heal on the Sabbath day. But according to their own tradition, that wasn't the proper thing to do. So they denied. And they too had just kept the feast, by the way. They denied this miracle. They said this not only denied this miracle, they denied that Jesus Christ could be anything special because he wasn't adhering to their rules. All right? Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Well, once again, people are still divided, saying, well, wait a minute, you're saying he can't heal, he can't be a man of God because he healed on the Sabbath, but on the other hand, if he's a sinner, why would God heal through him? You know, these are kind of contrasting thoughts, and so people are still divided on this. Then they said to the blind man again, uh, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. So a minute ago, he said, was this man named Jesus? But now, once he's pushed, grilled a little bit further, he goes a step further. He says, so tell, okay, you told us how he healed you, but what do you think this guy is? You know, is he some charlatan doing parlor tricks or whatever? The man said, no, he's a prophet. So see a step here in the blind man's growth, don't we? He believes that Jesus is a prophet. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of him who had received his sight. So they still don't believe him. They're going to do some fact checking and you know, see if this guy's story checks out. Verse 19 says, they asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So yes, this is definitely him. He was blind says, but by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. So this wasn't just a little kid, all right? This is an adult. It says, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had, had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So the parents are caving to political pressure at this point. 
You know, if they were to support Jesus Christ, then they'd get kicked out of church, so to speak. They'd be cast out of the synagogue. Now, the synagogue was very much the place and center of worship each week, but that was also the cultural and even the economic center for people. That's where people would gather to meet during the weekday to do business. That's where they socialize. And basically, to be cast out of the synagogue kind of meant being, you know, kicked out of town, so to speak, not just that you couldn't go to church one day a week. So it had serious repercussions, and, and they were a little nervous about it. Uh, they didn't want to they didn't want to get get kicked out. Verse twenty four, they say. Uh, verse twenty three, they say. You know, he's a big boy. Asking him. Verse twenty four, it says. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, "Give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner." So again, they had this thought stuck in their head. They acknowledged God. And wanted to give God the glory, but they said, we know this guy's a sinner. He has to be, you know, because he didn't do what we thought he should. Verse 25, he said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. Now, this man maybe hadn't known, seen Jesus. Well, he obviously hadn't seen him before, but didn't know Jesus. He said, that question I can't answer. He said, but one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, He says, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? So the fellow kind of pokes the bear <laughs> at this point. So he's like, I'm getting tired of explaining this to you all over and over again. He said, What do you want to tell you? Do you want to be his disciples now too? So, you know, he knew they didn't want to be his disciples, but he said, do you want to be his disciples too? He just declared himself a disciple. He said, yeah, I am. I'm following this guy. He was getting a little bit tired with it. He pokes the bear, and of course, they didn't like that none too much at all. Uh, Verse 28 says, then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. So now he's really, I don't know, he's gone past poking the bear to, I don't know, <laughs> stabbing the bear or whatever. They said, wow, you know, you're Moses' disciples. You guys know everything, but you don't know where he's from. But yet he was able to heal me. <laughs> kind of interesting that he's able to do the works of God, but you aren't associated with them. Hmm, what's that say about you? <laughs> well, this was basically all they needed to hear at this point. He says, he opened my eyes. He says, now that we know God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. He said, you know, this has never happened. Nobody was ever born blind and then just got better one day. Right? He said, since the beginning of time, that's never happened. He says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, the man makes this next step. He goes from saying that he was a prophet to saying, yes, I'm a disciple, to saying this man is from God. He said, there's no doubt. He said, if he wasn't, he could do nothing. Verse 34, they, being the leaders of the synagogue, says, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you're teaching us, and they cast him out. Once again, they were stuck in their thoughts. They had this thought, well, the guy's blind. Either he sinned or his parents. Had to be one or the other. You know, can't be for any other reason. <laughs> they said, well, yep, that's it. This proves that you were born in sin. That's it. They were locked in to their way of thinking. They refused to grow even though this miracle had been going on right in front of their very eyes. Verse 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? So the guy is willing to believe in the Son of God, but there's still a little bit of a, uh, I don't know if I would call it a hesitation. Maybe he just wants to, to make sure that, you know, he's answering properly. Maybe at this point, you know, he recognized that certainly this guy was a prophet, certainly that God had sent him, certainly that he was going to be a disciple and follow him, but maybe he wasn't 100% sure this was the Son of God. But Jesus answered and says, Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, 
and it is he who is talking with you. Imagine that moment in that guy's life. I mean, a lot of big, he had a busy day, as we say, right? <laughs> you know, he had been healed of blindness. He had been raked over the coals by the Pharisees, the leaders of the synagogue. He had been kicked out of church. He had been going through a lot of changes just in what was likely in one day, a few hours. And now, talking to him is the Son of God. And he had no doubts because he said, in verse 38, he says, Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is where the story of the man with the blindness comes to an end. But note the growth of the man. He went from being completely blind and unable to see, both physically and perhaps in a spiritual sense as well. I think there's an analogy there that we can draw from. He started with a simple act of obedience. And how many of us started that way? You know, your parents taught you to, to keep the Sabbath day, or maybe, you know, you, you came to the truth later on in life and you realized, well, you know, I, I don't think I should be keeping Christmas or I shouldn't be working on Saturday. And you said, okay, you know, I, maybe I don't understand what's going to happen in my life, but I'm going to do it because that's what God says to do. And it starts with a simple act of obedience. That's what this man did. Jesus Christ said, okay, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. He did, and, and his eyes were open. He then goes and says, well, you know, this was this man called Jesus. And he goes from there and says, well, th this guy was a prophet. <laughs> Uh, and, and then he goes on to say, I'm his disciple, to the point where he says, this is definitely a man of God, to the point where he actually worshipped him. Do you think if he hadn't made those changes, that he would have had this abundance in his life <laughs> poured out on him in this day, or a couple of days, a couple of hours, whatever it was? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think if he would have stagnated, I think if he would have stuck to what he always thought, had he refused to change like the leaders of the synagogue did, I don't think he would have been blessed with this abundance. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. So Jesus brings this full tilt and says, You know, I'm not just talking about physical blindness and a guy who was healed. I'm talking about those who refuse to see. You've heard that saying, probably there's none so blind as those who refuse to see. Jesus Christ basically lays it out there for them. Now, in verse, or excuse me, chapter 10, with all of this as a base, he goes on to give this message. Chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up by some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hears the, hear the voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. You know, that blind beggar, he heard Jesus' voice. He couldn't see him, so he literally heard his voice. He responded. Jesus responded by healing him. And it goes back and forth, and step by step, we see the personal growth that this man had. You know, uh, this fellow probably had had dozens of people maybe offer to try to heal him over the years. We're not told there. And maybe he tried some of those things, and then they didn't work. And so, you know, he doesn't try them anymore. But lo and behold, Jesus tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he does so. Now, he didn't start following somebody else who said, well, try this and see if this works, and by the way, worship these gods and do this thing and that and the other and follow some pagan religion, did he? He didn't follow that voice. 
he followed the true voice. Verse 7 says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Oh, Christ refers to those who had been uh, false prophets before. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they might live it more abundantly. You know, if we follow Jesus Christ, truly follow him, Listen to what he says. Obey his commands. Consider who he is, just as the blind man did. We don't have to just sit around and twiddle our thumbs. We don't have to just hurry up and wait for the end. We can have an abundant life. If we grow in our faith, we get bolder day by day. Maybe it doesn't all happen in the course of a few hours the way it did for this fellow. Maybe it takes, you know, weeks, months, decades for us to grow. But you know, if we choose to live a life and say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I am going to follow him, I am going to be obedient, he is worthy of worship. If we truly commit to making that choice, we can have an abundant life. We can have an abundant life. <coughs> Continues in verse 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. You know, it's my privilege to serve as your pastor. And I uh, take that role extremely seriously. But in the end, I better not be the guy you're following. Only follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ is the shepherd. It's he that we must follow. Verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep which I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. When Jesus Christ is foreshadowing his own death, and he's foreshadowing the fact that the gospel would go to the Gentiles, that they would be grafted in, that there would be one body, one church. Verse 17, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life, um, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And Christ points out that he obeyed the Father, right? He obeyed that. He said, I received this command from my Father. He didn't go out and, and die for us because he had to. <laughs> he did it because he wanted to. He did it because he wanted to. And he did it so that you and I could have an abundant life. He did it so we could have an abundant life. From here, if you read through the rest of the chapter, you'll see there was more debate uh, about who Jesus Christ was, whether he was crazy, did he have a demon, something like that. Seems like this likely draws to the end of the eighth day. Verse 22 indicates then some time has passed because they're talking about the, the Feast of Dedication that would have come in the winter. But it seems very likely here then this is the end of the eighth day. Now, whether the blind man was healed on the eighth day or just after the feast, we may not be able to say for sure. But what we do know is Jesus performed an awesome miracle by healing this man. By healing, by giving him a sight, that which he had not had since his, since his birth. He left his audience, those who witnessed these things, a decision to make. Was this Jesus Christ? Was this the Messiah? Or was this just some guy, a man called Jesus? If so, am I willing to follow him? Of course, that same question is the one that you and I have to ask ourselves. That question raged on from this point to the time of Jesus Christ's death, and it rages on today. And it's a very personal question for us. 
So what's the overall lesson that we can learn from this today? What can we take away from this? Now, just after the Feast of Tabernacles, people seemed to react to Jesus in one of two ways. They either went right back to their lives, believing what it is that they had always believed, that they were right, they knew best, and that they just had to basically bide their time. No miracle that Jesus performed would convince them. Or they saw Jesus Christ for who and what he was. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Good Shepherd. And they made a concerted effort to change, to follow Jesus Christ, to be a true disciple. Like the audience of that day, they were getting into those long winter months, and they had to make a choice about how they were going to face them. Are they going to twiddle their thumbs and try to get by, or are they going to live an abundant life? You and I have to make the same choice.